Amen. So Acts chapter 23. So here we have Paul, and he's being uh, brought in front of the, uh, the chief priest here. Um, and he has a little bit of a run-in um, with the chief priest, and that's where we really want to get into um, this evening and explain um, what happens here. There's a lot of um, doctrine and things that we can look at um, in these first few verses. So we're going to get five verses in tonight in Acts chapter 23. So, of course, um, Paul is having some problems in Jerusalem, as, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit told him that he would. And uh, they've got these, he's got these Romans that are, you know, trying to protect him after they know that he's a Roman citizen. But um, he keeps wanting to go in front of um, the Jews and the Jewish leaders and just keep making um, his case and making the case for Christ. Um, so he continues to do so, and he just keeps getting in more and more trouble. Look down at verse number 1 of Acts chapter 23, and let's get started um, this evening. And Paul earnestly beholding the council, now he's before um, the leaders um, here, he says, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So basically Paul says in verse number 1 that, you know, um, I followed my conscience. I'm following um, the law that God has given me in my heart. And, you know, again, he just defends this guy. And the, the high priest just says, somebody just smack this guy, right? So they smack, they, they punch him in the face, uh, basically. In verse number 3, um, Paul, um, he, he rebukes the high priest here. All right. And he said, then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. So he's saying, to the, he basically rebukes the high priest and says, you know, God's going to punch you in the face. God's going to take you down. God's going to attack you because you're not following the law. So he just rebukes the high priest right to his face. And then they think, you know, this is so, so pharisaical right here. They think that they've caught him in the law because he rebukes the high priest. And they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest. And then verse number five um, is, the, is the verse where a lot of, I've heard many different, uh, you know, views of verse number five, but I think there's only one view that makes any sense. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, meaning I knew not. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So, you know, what's going on here? I mean, basically, Paul, in verse number three, he rebukes the high priest, and then they basically quote, turn to Exodus chapter 22. That's basically what they're throwing in his face. They're throwing Exodus chapter two, 22, verse number 28 in Paul's face here, and um, saying, you know, you shouldn't rebuke um, the high priest. You shouldn't revile the high priest, that's actually the, the word reviled that Exodus chapter 28, or extra, Exodus chapter 22 and verse number 28 uses. If you're there in Exodus chapter 22, verse number 28, here's what um, the Bible says. It says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Turn to Psalm chapter 82. Turn to Psalm chapter 82. So that's what they're quoting, what they're throwing at Paul. Now when it says the gods here, that's uh, what I want to explain to you before we even get back to what's going on with Paul. Um, this term, the gods, is used in this case to talk about the magistrates, the judges. Um, it's, it's the same word um, that was translated um, from the Hebrew that's also used in Exodus chapter 22, other places, as judge. Um, so it's not talking about, like, gods, like false idols, things like that. Look at Psalm chapter 82, if you're there. I'll just give you a couple examples of this. It says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth, he judgeth, judgeth, can't read tonight, amongst, among the gods. Again, talking about um, the rulers. If we keep reading in Psalm chapter 82, you kind of get a better context. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? So now he's talking about, he's basically talking to these rulers in Psalm chapter 82 that they're judging unjustly. So, these God stands, you know, Psalm chapter 82 is saying that God stands in the congregation. He's there amongst the judges. These judges or, or the gods, the lowercase g as they're called here, are, are judging unjustly. If you look at uh, verse number 6, Jesus actually quotes verse number 6 of Psalm chapter 82 in John 10, 34. We won't go there. But he says, I have said, ye are gods. 
and all of you are children of the Most High. So he's not saying, like, you're gods. Like, you know, this isn't Mormonism, okay? He's saying, you know, you're judges. You should be judging justly, is what he's saying. That's what Jesus, that's the same context. Well, why don't you just go ahead and turn there? Let's just go ahead and, and, and do a, a third Bible study tonight. Go ahead and turn to John, John chapter 10. Jesus uses this, this um, Psalm chapter 82 to rebuke who? To rebuke, again, rebuke the Pharisees. Okay, so he says to them in John chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's saying, you know, you're judges, but he's, he's quoting Psalm chapter 82 because he's saying, you're not just, you're not according to the law. Very similar to exactly what Paul is doing in Acts chapter 23. Just rebuking the ruler here, rebuking the high priest telling him, hey, whited wall, God's going to smite you. You know, because you're what, you're, what, what did he say he's doing? You're not doing according to the law. You're not acting what? Justly. Okay? So all that to say this. They're throwing at Exodus chapter 22 in his face. And then it says, of course, in Exodus 22, 28, nor curse the ruler of thy people. And I'm going to kind of get into that a little deeper um, later. But that being said, that being said, let's go back to Paul's um, comment. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Okay, so most people agree that Paul wrote Hebrews, and I believe that Paul um, wrote Hebrews. Um, so first of all, let me just say this. Paul rebukes this man in verse number three. He rebukes him, and they said, you know, revilest thou not, you know, revilest thou God's high priest? And then he's like, oh, you know, I wish not. Some people believe, I mean, I, I, I think I've read a lot of stupid commentary on this, this passage here where people say like, oh, Paul's apologizing. You know, he's apologizing because, you know, he didn't know who Ananias was and all this. Look, there is zero chance that Paul did not know that Ananias was the high priest. Zero. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was an upper-level Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew in verse number one exactly who Ananias was. So it's not like Paul was like, oh, you're the high priest. No, he knew exactly who he was the entire time. He knew who he was in verse number three when he rebuked him to his face. All right, that's the first thing. That's like 100% that he knew that Ananias was the high priest. So then you say, what is verse number five about? Well, I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, but it's even more evidence that Paul himself penned Hebrews itself. Hebrews, like the main theme of Hebrews is this. Look at Hebrews chapter four and verse number 14. The main theme of Hebrews, probably the top theme of Hebrews, is verse number 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, which cannot be touched, I'm sorry, with the feelings of our infirmities, saying, like, look, Jesus was tempted with all the temptations that we have. He felt all the temptations that you feel. He went through all the pain, the suffering, all the, the, the saying Jesus was a man as much as he was God, okay? But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So who's our high priest? And who did Paul know that our high priest was? Jesus taught Paul himself for three years. Paul knew that Jesus Christ was the high priest. What he's saying in verse number five is he's just like, He's just like, you're not the high priest. <laughs> it's, what he's, it's basically what he's saying. It's a sarcastic rebuke is, is what it is. And look, if you, you know, that's the main point of Hebrews, which Paul wrote, which Paul would have known, all right? But the, narr the narrative, the narrative that Paul, oh, let me say this too. Like I, I've heard, you know, people like, oh yeah, you know, this is a, a, I've heard it even thrown out as a Bible contradiction that like, oh, Paul made a mistake and then one verse later, he has to correct his mistake, so it's a Bible contradiction. Look, even if Paul did make a mistake, and he correct, that's not a Bible contradiction. It's just, Paul's just a man in the Bible. That's what you have to understand in the Bible. When you're reading stories in the Old Testament, a lot of people have a hard time with the Old Testament in this way. You read stories in the Old Testament, and you're like, man, that is a messed up story. Like, people are doing some crazy stuff in the Old Testament. It's just what men did. It doesn't mean that God was on board with that. And the Bible is usually clear about, you know, that these people are doing the wrong things. Judges 19, like the, the, the most nutso story in the whole Bible 
And you're just like, how in the world is, is this happening? And it, it, at the end of Judges, it tells you every man did that which was right in his own eyes. God's not on board with it. It's just what men did. It's just what men did, and docu it's documented in the Bible. So look, even if Paul was apologizing, which he's not, it was definitely a sarcastic rebuke by Paul for two reasons. There's zero chance, number one, that Paul did not know that Ananias was the high priest. And second of all, Paul did not respect him in that position. He did not see that he was in that position because Jesus is our high priest. Okay? So what about this idea? There's still one problem, right? What about this idea in Exodus chapter 22 about, you know, don't, revi you know, don't rebuke a ruler, basically, is what Exodus chapter 22. Let me read it um, for you again. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. What about that? All right, we still got to go, you know, after that one. What about the idea of rebuking a ruler? So that's what we're going to look at this evening. We know for sure that this is a sarcastic rebuke because of the two reasons I just gave you. But what about rebuking a ruler? Turn to Romans chapter 13. So we're going to go through Romans chapter 13, the first part here, talking about rulers and authorities in our lives in great detail, and I'm going to show you that, like, look, remember your first Bible reading rule, okay? The Bible must be consistent, otherwise you're interpreting something wrong. So a lot of people, um, not anybody that I know, but I mean, there's people out there in other churches or whatever that, that teach Romans 13 means you just have to listen to the government no matter what. And look, that is not consistent with other authority commands in the Bible. All right, so we're going to go through that verse by verse, and I'm going to show you what it does say and what it doesn't say. All right, so remember, Bible reading rule. If you interpret the Bible in a way that contradicts other part of the Bible, other parts of the Bible, especially other clear parts of the Bible, you are interpreting it wrong. The problem is you, not the Bible. All right, so look, what are the other parts that I'm talking about? The Bible talks about clear authority structures in the family, for example, for children um, and their parents. So children are to obey their parents. In Ephesians chapter 6, the very first verse, it says, you know, children obey your parents. But then it says, it always gives this caveat, it says, in the Lord. Meaning, a parent can't tell their child, hey, go murder someone, or hey, do something that is, you know, against the Bible. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Okay, it's very similar to husbands and wives. I mean, husbands, I mean, husbands are to, you know, be the leaders of their household. Wives are to submit to their husbands. I mean, but then it says, as unto the Lord, when it comes to wives submitting to their husbands. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. So look, what that means is, is that wives should listen to, submit to their husbands as long as it is according to the Bible. And look, a lot of things just aren't detailed in the Bible. So as long as it's not against the Bible, this is where I got famous, right? This is where I got famous. And, you know, everyone's like, ah! But yeah, just, hey, go do it like the world's doing it. And, and call me in 10 years and let me know how that works for you. But the Bible says the husband's in charge. So that means that according to the Bible and things that don't have anything to do with the Bible, you know, just how the house is run, how the house is organized, all those things. If it's, you know, if it's not against what the Bible says, the, the wife is to follow the leadership of her husband. It's that simple. That's the authority structure that God puts in place. And I don't really care if it's popular today. If people just freak out over that. It, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. All right, but look, Acts chapter 15 is another example of this, where Peter says, so imagine if Romans chapter 13 that we're going to read, if it said that we must obey the government at every cost, at everything that they say, how could this be true? When, when Peter says in Acts chapter 15 that they said, we ought, you know, remember when they went and they preached, they got out of prison, and they went, just went right back and preached again, and Peter says we ought to obey God rather than men? How could that be consistent with just this idea that we should just obey the government no matter what kind of wicked command that they give us? It would make, it's, it's a contradiction, but it's not what it says. So let's turn to Romans chapter 13 and let's go through this. So we're talking about how could Paul have rebuked a ruler here? 
Because that's what he did. He, he basically said, God's going he's, to God's gonna strike you down, is what he told this guy after he had somebody, you know, hit him in the face. But, you know, what does Romans chapter 13 say that is consistent with other parts of the Bible? Look at Romans chapter 13 if you're there. Let's go through this verse by verse. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be ordained of God. So, I mean, right there, we could just really quit reading right there. Because it's basically saying, let every, you know, let every soul, meaning every person, be, you know, be obedient or be subject unto the higher powers. Who's the highest power? The highest power, I don't care what kind of structure you're talking about, whether it be the family, whether it be your workplace, whether it be the church, the highest power is God. Even government, whatever. It says there's no power but of God. The powers now, it says the powers that be are ordained of God. All right? So that's, people will take that and be like, okay, anybody that's in a leadership position, that, you know, they're, they're a godly person. That is not what that says. Okay? So it says, look, there's higher powers. We know that God is the highest power. That's number one. And then it just says the powers that be are ordained of God. What that's saying is, that God has an authority structure. And we see that consistently throughout the Bible. God has an authority structure for the church. God has an authority structure for the family. God even has an authority structure for work. That's where all the talk of servants and masters comes in. You know, you have an authority structure pretty much everywhere in your life. And it's no different. First of all, it doesn't even talk about, it doesn't even point out like government yet at this point. All it's saying is, is God's plan is there. It, God's plan is for there to be a structure. That's all it's saying. Someone to be in charge is what it's talking about. It, there's no detail on types of government here. There's no de It doesn't even really specifically say yet that it's talking about government at this point. If we were to apply just verse number one to government, here's what we could take from it. If we're just to apply verse number one to a government, here's what we could take. God's against anarchy. That's what we could take. Which makes perfect sense because you never see God ruling his nation, you know, through anarchy. You never see just like no one in charge. You know, you, you, see, you see Moses being God's, you know, um, God's messenger. You see the judges. Then you see kings. You always see some kind of structure, some kind of authority, you know, in charge of God's people. All right? So, just because someone is ordained, there's a structure that's ordained to be in charge, it does not mean that they will be a godly ruler, according to God. I mean, the Bible itself proves that through the history of the kings, especially. All right? So it's a wrong interpretation to say that, okay, every ruler anywhere is godly. I mean, that's, that's insanity to, to interpret that this way. All right? So it just says that they have a God-ordained role. They have a God-ordained responsibility. Look, I, I, I have a God-ordained role here as the pastor. That doesn't mean that I, as a man, am guaranteed to be a godly pastor. There's plenty of bad pastors out there. As a matter of fact, there's plenty of pastors that started out good and then went bad. Look, don't worry, but I'm just saying, like, it, it's, it's just, the man is just in the role, okay? The man is in the ordained role. So, I'm just a man in an ordained role that God ordained. God ordained that there be a, a man as a pastor of a church. And then Christ is the head of that church. I just want to be that man, all right? Plenty of pastors are, are, are bad from the start or, or go bad or whatever, okay? Like I said, don't worry, everything's fine. But the point is, it's not talking about the man, okay? It's talking about the position. Look at verse number two. Look at verse number two. Whosoever, therefore, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Here it's saying, you know, it doesn't say obey every leader no matter what they do or say. It says resist the power, the ordinance of God. It's talking about the ordinance of government. It's just these, these are people that resist the idea of structure of authority. That's what it's talking about here. Okay, and look, it's, it's some pretty powerful language. It says, receive to themselves damnation. You know, just talking about just the seriousness of, you know, just rejecting authority in your life. And look, I've preached 
whole sermons on this one thing. I'm telling you, and, and look, it needs to be said in the Bible because there's a lot of people like this. There's a lot of people like this that just can't receive and can't follow authority in their life. And I'm telling you, the Bible uses serious language because it's a serious thing. If it was a meteor coming towards the earth, it'd be a planet killer, in my opinion. Just having that one problem. Look, you can have some problems that you can keep under control and maybe some sins that you struggle with that you can keep under control that maybe won't necessarily ruin your whole life. But this is a big one. Like, if you're just the kind of person that just, I just reject all authority in my life, I mean, you can't ever work for anybody. You know, you have no relationship with your parents. I mean, you just, like, that's why the Bible's so serious about children and their parents. You know, and then, again, I mean, uh, you'll never be able to be in a church. I mean, you'll never have long friendships. I mean, it's just, it's a disaster. Okay, so that's what the Bible's talking about, saying, hey, you don't be the kind of person that just doesn't accept any authority in your life. You know, it's a serious thing because it's ordained by God that there be authority in your life. Even the Bible says that, you know, for Christians, we have pastors and teachers and evangelists. I mean, you are given these things in your life, look, not to rule over you, but to, to help you. You know, these are, these are tools that God gives you. All right? So, it's not talking about the person. Okay? It's not even talking about the structure of government. It's just talking about the idea of this. Right? It's basically, so far, so far this is a treatise, treatise against anarchy. Okay? So, you get all these people like, we should just abolish all the government. No. That's not, I mean, that's not what the Bible says. That's clearly what Romans 13 is talking about. No, I mean, anarchy would be a disaster. Anarchy would be, especially in this country, you know, when people don't have any moral structure, people don't have a family structure, anarchy would be a complete disaster, all right? So this is a treatise against anarchy to this point. Look at, um, look at Romans chapter 3 in verse, Romans chapter 13, look at verse number 3. I mean, Ephesians 4 says he gave some apostles, you know, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for what? For the perfecting of the saints. It's, it's to help you. It's to sharpen you. This is why God gives these authority structures is for your benefit, is, is what he's saying. All right, look at verse number three. And he's saying, respect those authorities, respect those structures. And now he gets into a little kind of detail about, you know, the, the types of rulers that he's looking for in verse number three. He says, for rulers, he's like saying, because, this is why you should follow that ordinance, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now he's kind of getting to the specifics about what an actual government, you know, think about just a monarchy, like a king, you know, a ruler, all right? Just, you know, look, I, a monarchy wouldn't be a bad thing, if, as long as you had the right king, you see? That's why a monarchy is going to be a really good thing in the millennial reign, because we're going to have Jesus as the king. So a monarchy, the only reason a monarchy is a bad idea is, is because of the man in the, in the, in the, on the throne. That's why it doesn't really work on earth. It says, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So these rulers are to be a terror to evil. They are to come after evil, and they are to be, um, you know, for the good. Wilt thou then be afraid? Wilt thou, thou, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. So it's saying, you should be afraid, a, a good ruler you should be afraid of if you're bad, is basically what they're saying. But they'll praise you if you're good. So the ruler is, is assumed in Romans chapter 13 to be good and to be a terror to evil. That, I mean, that's the point of the ruler, basically, is what he's saying in Romans chapter 13. So directions for the rulers here are rulers to be for, they're to be for good and against evil, so these passages, by the way, they're assuming good rulers. They're assuming good rulers. And we, so there's two, there's two directions here in verse number three. It's like the rulers are to be for good, and we are to be on the side of good. And then we'll get praise from those same rulers. Look at verse number four. There's even more evidence of this. Verse number four. For he, this is the ruler. Let's just picture a king, okay? For he is the minister of God to thee for good. So he is to, you know, be a, a servant of God to you for good things, okay? But if thou do which is that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. 
for he is the minister of God, a revenger to ex execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So again, we see this picture of this ruler that not only is he here to punish you know, people that are evil, he's there to bring wrath upon people that are evil on this earth, and you're to be afraid of him if you're evil or you're doing evil. Wherefore, because of this, he says, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Again, conscience sake there meaning that, you know, my conscience, if I'm following my conscience, I'm not going to have any problems with this ruler in Romans chapter 13. And my conscience, where did that come from? It came from the law of God that he wrote in my heart. All right? So look, it's assuming that this ruler in Romans chapter 13 is ruling according to God's law is what it's assuming here. Look at verse number 6. And it gets into some details here. And we talked about some of these details on Sunday morning on hills not to die on. He says, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. And again, if Jesus, so he's saying just pay the taxes that they want to put on you. He's like, they're God's ministers. So if Jesus hadn't addressed this tax thing, Christians might have a leg to stand on to say, look, my tax dollars are, are being spent on, on murder, and my tax dollars are being spent on, you know, fornication and sinful things and wicked, evil things that are hurting people. I'm not going to pay those taxes. The Christian might have a leg to stand on if it wasn't for Jesus in those two examples we looked at where he said, just give it to him. It's on Caesar. It's basically, that's Caesar's problem, all right? That's not a hill that we're to die on. He says, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear. We know why we would fear this ruler. We would only fear this ruler if we were doing evil. Honor to whom honor. So, you know, Jesus, of course, addresses tribute other places, but he basically just says, just give it to them. So the point is, the Bible here is saying, respect these positions. Respect these positions. But, he, but Romans chapter 13 is also, you know, giving some direction to the rulers themselves, saying, you're to be for good and against evil. All right? There's nothing in there that says if there's some evil ruler asking you to commit murder or whatever that you have to do that. There's nothing in there that says that. It's just saying God has ordained authority in your life. God has ordained, ordained authority over a nation. And look, there's some governments. It doesn't even talk about the type of government. There's some governments that just, like, by their very design are just unbiblical, like communism. Just by itself. It's automatically just like against the Bible. So it's obviously not talking about that. It's talking about a ruler, you know, a king, somebody who's in charge of the people. All right, so look, the structure of authority, the leaders to be against evil, and, you know, it's obviously talking about some form of government that at least has the ability to be godly. <laughs> if there's a godly person or a godly leader there. Okay, I always think of a monarchy when I think of that verse because it just, it's typical, you know, a president or a monarchy or something um, like that. It would even fit in the United States, you know, with our Congress, our president, our, you know, our three branches of government if they were for good and against evil, which they are not, all right? But back to this idea of rebuking leaders. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. So it's not there, right? It's not there saying, hey, do whatever some wicked person tells you to do. It's just talking about God gave a structure. God wants there to be structure. Obey the authorities in your life. All right? Look at Matthew chapter 14. Look at verse number 1. Here's a king right here. So here's a king, Herod the Tetrarch. He is a, a ruler over a section of the Roman Empire. And look at verse number 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, and he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. Well, why is he dead, Herod? And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. John the Baptist rebuked Herod. That's what got him killed. John the Baptist saw this king, this ruler, and he went up to him, and he went and he just rebuked him to his face and said, it is not lawful for you to be doing what you're doing. And then that is why Herod, you know, eventually had him, 
put to death, or Herodias, uh, you know, Herod actually did it, but what was he doing? He was rebuking him. He was preaching against him, is what he was doing. So he said, well, what about an environment where you're not, you know, so, I mean, that's kind of what Paul is doing. He's just kind of rebuking the high priest. He's preaching against him to his face. The same thing John the Baptist did, because he was doing a wicked thing, he was doing an evil thing, and they were wrong, right? They were not rulers for the good against evil. And what were they doing? They were obeying the higher powers is what they were doing, which is what? The word of God. That's what they're doing. It's very simple. It's very consistent in the Bible, okay? So look, you think about it this way, though. What about an environment? What about an environment where you aren't allowed to preach against the rulers? I mean, there's a lot of environments like that even today where you just can't say certain things against the rulers. I mean, thank, thank God, not in this country yet, N not yet. You know, we're, we're getting close, but not yet anyway. But look, this actually cost, this was the environment that John was in. It literally cost John the Baptist his life to preach against Herod in this way. He got thrown in prison. Eventually, he got killed. But the point is, it's man's job, especially the man of God's job, to preach the truth no matter the environment. So it's not like, oh, the government wants to do this. We can't preach. No, what in the world? That is not anywhere in the Bible. Okay? So an immoral command given to a Christian, he or she has no obligation to follow, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Okay? And, of course, as Americans, we think, well, you know, what about, you know, what about an environment where you can't say what you want? And Americans always think because, you know, we're revolutionaries at heart, right? Because we're Americans. Americans always think, like, well, if it gets so bad in this country, what about, you know, where we can't preach the truth and all these things? You know, what about the revolutionary? That's what the, the Americans will, will think. You know, even politicians today... Um, talk about national divorce and all these types of things you're starting to hear about. But here's what you have to understand as a Christian. Americans tend to think of revolutions like they're, they're a little skewed on revolutions because we basically are beneficiaries of a unique revolution. All right? But you have to understand that if, we, if I gauge a revolution, how would I gauge a revolution? I would gauge a revolution, whether it was good or whether it was bad, to whether or not we come out of that revolution and I'm able to preach truth more freely or not. I mean, that's basically my measuring stick about a revolution. The American Revolution was unique in the sense that, you know, it did increase, you know, the ability to be able to preach the truth, you know, freely. All right? But there's a lot of revolutions that are bad. As a matter of fact, the majority of revolutions, I would say, are bad. <laughs> I mean, think about, like, the Bolshevik Revolution. You know, you think about like when, you know, the Soviet Union was formed and, and the Bolsheviks, you know, um, kicked out the czars in, you know, the early 1900s and we had, we, we had the Soviet Union that killed 100 million people or whatever it was. I mean, that's not a good revolution. You know, that revolution caused all the religious people and all the, you know, all the smart people to all be killed. You know, they rounded them all up and they killed them all because in that system of government, the, you know, the state is God. So they can't have somebody else preaching God. They can't have somebody else preaching a higher power. So they have to get rid of all that. So look, a lot of revolutions, I mean, the French Revolution, I mean, this one's debatable. But the French Revolution, it, it, was, it was basically like mob just take, you know, one mob took over and murdered all the other people, and then another mob took over and murdered everybody. I mean, it was just like murdering mobs. And you can debate, you know, whether or not what came out of that was better or worse um, for the kingdom of God on earth. I guess that's, that's a debate that can be had. But the point is, not every revolution and, and many revolutions are not the American Revolution. Where, and as a matter of fact, you can credit the Baptists for the American Revolution producing what it did. Because when they were forming the government after the, the American Revolution, they were actually going to fund... Um, Protestant denominations out of the, the government of the United States that was formed after the American Re Revolution was won. They were going to, they were, Patrick Henry and others were actually going to, you know, pick, you know, a few de Protestant denominations and be like, these are going to be the state denominations. So when you pay your taxes, you can choose which church that part of your taxes will go to. 
And the Baptists were like, you know, no. You know, we're not going to. And, and finally, you know, James Madison went and visited with the Baptists at the, at the behest of George Washington. And they went and talked. Look, they're not Baptists. George Washington, James Madison weren't Baptists. But they went and talked to the Baptists. And they're like, hey, for once in history, it's the Baptists getting killed the whole time. For 2,000 years, the Baptists are getting killed. For once in history, James Madison says, hey, we'll let you have a seat at the table. We'll let you be one of these denominations. Look, we're not Protestants. We've never been Protestants. And we're not protesting the Catholic Church. We were never part of it. People think, you go look on Wikipedia and they say that Baptists are Protestant. They're not. Baptists are what John the Baptist was. And they existed all the way from John the Baptist. They just didn't go to the stupid council that created the heretical Catholic Church in 300 AD. They just didn't go to that. They didn't participate in it. That's why they were hunted. That's why they were hunted for hundreds of years. So they're finally given a seat at this table and they say, no, we don't want to have any part of the government. No, we want free will to preach. Look, Baptists were getting arrested. Did you know this? Baptists were getting arrested for preaching before in the United States. In the colonies, Baptists were arrested a lot in the colonies before the Revolutionary War. They're like, hey, we just want to be able to preach the truth. We believe that the gospel can stand on its own. And we don't need some state-sponsored denomination. That's where the First Amendment came from. James Madison went back and he sold this idea. He sold this idea to Thomas Jefferson and all sorts of other people that got on board. And, and, you know, not that those people were Christians, but it was the Baptist idea that planted the, the, the seed. And it's why we have the First Amendment today. So, you know, we can thank our Baptist forefathers for that. You know, a lot of people don't know that story. But... Today, if there was a revolution today, it's like, what's going to come out of that? Where are the good guys? <laughs> you, somebody, you know, everyone's talking, you know, a couple of politicians always talk about, we need a national divorce. I'm like, uh, divorce to what? You know, what, what, is there a godly group out there somewhere? It's like, no, you know, whatever. Just let me preach the truth. Let us preach the truth. Let us have some freedom. We can just keep preaching the truth, and that's all we need. All right, so just, just when you ever think about revolution, just remember that most revolutions, you know, they, they produce some wicked things. All right, just remember that. So I don't even know where I was going with this. But anyway, for us, the mission is always the same. Just remember that, okay? The mission is always the same. It's just a question. It's just a question of how dangerous it will be. And with John, you know, to rebuke a ruler was as dangerous as it gets. He cut his head off, right? So back to Romans, Romans 13 basically has two points that I wanted to make. It's basically preaching, it's basically teaching against anarchy, okay? It's basically teaching against anarchy and that the purpose of that ordination is for good to punish evil, okay? That's the, the statement of, that's the, that's the lesson of Romans 13, but in the very first verse, it puts that same caveat that it puts in for children and parents. It puts that same caveat that it puts in for husbands and wives. The higher powers always apply. So it's absolutely consistent. God is always the highest power. So, yeah, it's wrong. And, and, and rulers like governors and presidents that support murder and child abuse and all these things that are just being openly supported today, they need to be rebuked. And you know, what, you know what they need to hear? That God is going to smite thee. And look, it's, it's, I, I, that's what's going to happen. God's going to smite them. Because these things don't go, they won't go unpunished. Because no matter what kind of messed up system we put together down here, God's the highest power, and he, he has all the power. And he will punish the evil. We know that for sure. All right? So people just need a proper understanding. Look, Romans 13 should be read by our leaders today, is who Romans 13 should be read by. Hey, you're supposed to be for the good. You're supposed to be for good against evil. That's who needs to read Romans 13. You know, not, not the people, all right? Romans 13 is for the rulers. I mean, of course, the art in this country, the people get the rulers that they deserve. But the point is, it's as much for the rulers as it is for the people. Right? Of course, all this wisdom only comes from the Bible, which nobody knows, so here we are.
right? So Paul rebuked the high priest. Then he followed it up with sarcasm and another rebuke. <laughs> Basically is what he did. And you can see, you can see that they knew that from their coming reaction to him too, that we're going to look at um, next week. And here's another thing, just more evidence. Show me, show me an example of Paul trying to avoid trouble in the book of Acts. I mean, show me an example where Paul, I mean, where Paul's just like, oh man, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. I mean, talk about going against his character. He doesn't care about trouble. I mean, he said twice before he even went to Jerusalem, I don't care. I know it's going to be bad. And though God himself is telling Paul, you're going to get in trouble there. They're going to bind you. They're going to tie you up. They're going to, you know, you're going to be arrested there. All this. And Paul's like, I don't care about myself. I don't care about myself. Paul has no nature to try and avoid trouble. So yeah, he rebuked him and he followed it up with another rebuke. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.